and this is Loma Wildlife Committee's program on the American Kestrel Nesting Box Program. And kestrels are, are beautiful small hawks that benefit us by eating rodents and insects. And I just had to quickly mention that on my way, wouldn't you know, on my way driving over, they were doing, they were interviewing someone who had been in China at the time that Mao had them kill all the birds because he thought they were eating the grain, but really the birds were eating the insects. And, you know, so that's, that's the benefit of, of having birds around. But the Kestrel population declined 47% from 1966 to 2011, largely due to a loss of habitat and nesting sites. And that's, that's an issue that many cavity nesting birds are having. So you may remember our speaker from, on, from when he presented to us for the Bluebird, Bluebird Project that has gotten all the, the Bluebird nesting boxes around the golf course. And today he's here, he's involved in a similar project to help kestrels with, with nesting boxes for them. Doug is an active member of the Virginia Society of Ornithology, which sponsors the American Kestrel Nesting Box Project. Doug is also the president of the Monticello Bird Club. He's a board member of the Virginia Bluebird Society and former editor of their newsletter, The Bird Box. So in his spare time, Doug is an avid outdoor photography and his main subject is, well, birds. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Doug Rogers. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> thank you, Jack. And thank you, Gene DeMarco, for inviting me again. And thank you for all of you who have come to listen to this show. Um, and thanks to Jack, I turned off my cell phone. Uh, I spend a fair amount of time in a blind that looks like a little camouflage tent that I use to hide from the birds so I can shoot their pictures. And I thought, all right, if I'm in the blind and my phone rings, I don't want to scare away something that I've waited for an hour to show up. <laughs> so my phone sounds like a cricket when, <laughs> when it rings. <laughs> well, I didn't want that to go while we were doing this, this uh, presentation. American Kest Kestrel Nesting Box Project. Kestrel, as you're gonna see shortly, is the smallest falcon in North America. Um, it's in that family of predators. It's not a hawk, it's a falcon. There's several species of them. And unlike the bluebirds, um, the kestrel is not a pussycat. It's a tough bird for a bird that's no bigger than, than a blue jay. The American Kestrel Nesting Box Project is a volunteer effort by the Virginia Society of Ornithologists, and you'll hear me refer to them as the VSO. The American Kestrel is, the, as I said, its most common and widespread falcon, but populations have declined just about 50% over the last few years according to uh, North American Breeding Bird Survey. Partners in Flight is an international bird conservation organization. They estimate the global breeding population at four million. With these percentages, as you see on the screen, that stay here, Mexico, Canada, the rest of them are in South America. And as all of you have heard, probably many times, different bird species are declining. Can you guys see over there okay? Many of them are declining because of us. Um, continued clearing of land with trees that contain nesting cavities and competition for those cavities. Uh, the competition for those cavities come from invasive species like starlings. Those birds were brought here, uh, as you probably heard me say last year, to take out the uh, Japanese beetles. But they're a very aggressive bird. They're a cavity nester. 
Whoops. And amazingly, they will take the they will keep the kestrels from those natural cavities, even though that kestrel is a predator. The loss of prey sources, unlike bluebirds that eat berries and small insects, kestrels eat small mammals and large insects. And the farming practices that we have in this country that they call clean farming, they eliminate all the trees that have nesting cavities in them. And they'll do some other things that I'm gonna tell you about in a few minutes. The exposure to pesticides and other pollutants can reduce the clutch size. A clutch is um, the number of eggs that a bird lays. And they can reduce the hatching success. And pesticides destroys the insects, spiders, and small mammals that, and other prey that this species depends on. The habitat destruction that's going on, you see it all around us. And then you go out in the country and you might see this. And you say, all right, hmm, there's a little pointer there, but it doesn't show up so well there. Can you see that little red dot? Yes. What's wrong there? What's going on there? Farmers now will go and spray Roundup over an entire field, kill everything on it. Then they'll plow it and plant it in corn that has been uh, genetically modified to resist the Roundup. And that corn will grow with no bugs, no pests, no nothing, because you've killed everything there. Now, when a kestrel, if you have a kestrel that has a nest here somewhere, comes out here looking for mice, voles, large insects, everything out there is dead. Everything out there is dead, so the kestrel has nothing to eat. In the last years, if you look at this graph from 1850 to now, you can see that the, num the number of farms has declined dramatically. The average farm size, this red line, has gone up, while the land in farms in billions of acres has remained roughly the same. But when you have these much larger farms, you have these much larger fields where everything has been cleared off. Trees, brush, everything. And that leaves creatures like the kestrel with nothing to eat and no place to nest. And if you go to the neonicotinoid chemicals, these chemicals are killing the bees if you guys read that sort of thing, you've probably read, I see your head shaking, yes. Bees are being destroyed, whole colonies of them, by the tens of thousands. And when this started happening, the people said, well, what's going on? What's wrong? Well, it's not a mystery. These neonicotinoids are killing everything. And the number of them that are being used, you can see by this graph, has gone up dramatically. Because these chemicals eliminate the bugs, farmers are happy, doesn't kill any of their, any of their crops go to these bugs. This stuff, brush killer, same thing. Have you seen these trucks alongside the road? The, st the stuff that they're spraying there is poison. Poison, and that stuff goes into the land, into the water, and uh, I keep hearing the expression that says, if we can't farm the land, drink the water, or breathe the air, what do we have? Uh, your billionaire job might not work too well if those three things are gone. Farmers, right on the back of their tractor, and you see this, whoops, you see this yellow jug right here? Poison. So, all of that goes into causing this great decline in the bird population. 
And it's not only kestrels. <clears throat> you familiar with bobolinks? Probably don't see too many of them around here. Uh, when you see this bird watcher with a camera, that's me. <laughs> I started doing uh, photography four years ago and I thought I can't call myself a photographer yet. I don't have all the equipment or all the training, but I'm a bird watcher. Male bobolink. Uh, this picture was shot up in Highland County. <clears throat> very rural county up there that's not quite so poisoned yet. That's the guy, this is the girl. They're a grassland bird. They need grassland to live, to raise their babies, to eat. And that grassland is disappearing. Another grassland species, loggerhead shrike. You see these around here sometime, although they are another species that's dramatically declined in the, in the last decade. Another one, Savannah Sparrow, grassland bird. Has to have the grassland for the seeds and the bugs and all that and a place to live. Who's familiar with this bird? Dick Sissel, another grassland bird and their numbers are dramatically declining and you see them um, around. You don't see them too often in this area but they, they are around. There's another one, uh, this picture was shot up in uh, um, north of Charlottesville, up in Greene County, where a lady I know has a 600 acre farm and they raise beef cows on there, beef cattle on there. And of course she has the, the uh, dick thistles and other grassland birds. Another grassland bird, you familiar with this one? Meadow lark. Meadowlark, beautiful song, Meadowlark. And they too need the grassland and, and their areas are getting uh, poisoned out. Why are kestrels important? Valuable predator. They eat tons of moles and voles and large insects, and beetles, as you're gonna see in, in just a few minutes. Natural pest control, and they're entertaining. You probably see them a lot on wires as you're driving down the road. Um, they're just a small bird, very colorful. The goal of this project is to install kestrel nest boxes in suitable habitat throughout the state. Now, we gave three reasons for their decline. The use of pesticides, the clean farming practices, and the lack of a nest site. Well, we can't change those farmers. We can't get rid of the neonicotinoids. I always seem to leave out one of the syllables in that word for some reason. But we thought we could put up nest boxes so we can help them that way. The kestrel that I mentioned earlier, America's smallest falcon about the size of a blue jay and you usually see them around agricultural fields. Very colorful, I'm gonna show you some photos of them in just a few minutes. Um, that's the female. There's her guy. You can see the, right? What's that? Did you take that photo? Yes. Very good. See where it says bird watcher with a camera? All of them are mine. <laughs> was that a local picture? Or? Uh, this one was shot up near Harrisonburg. And this one was down at the uh, Dominion Energy Power Plant down uh, the other side of Richmond, a place called Dutch Gap. I was there one day and this guy was here with his woman. And he would sit there just like that and look at me. Go ahead, shoot my picture. I'm cool. <laughs> the girl he was with wouldn't sit there a second. The minute I showed up, boom, she was gone. No, my hair isn't done enough. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's him. Kestrels, what do they need? Pesticide. Pesticide-free open field habitat, small mammal, and large insects. 
and suitable nesting cavities. This project's goal is to give them that suitable nesting cavities. Ideal habitat is an open area, short ground, scattered trees, like that. Where the cattle are and the horses, good place. And this group of five people, we call ourselves the Kestrel Strike Force. The guy that's the major box builder, he's got kind of a quirky sense of humor, came up with that. When I came on the team, they wanted me to raise my right hand and take an oath <laughs> to do this thing. And here is four of them. This one is Mary Ames, Dave White, Patty Rhyme, Dan Beaker, he's the major box builder, and me. The Kestrel Strike Force truck, here we have it loaded up. Kestrel nest boxes, it's a little Toyota pickup. And the box itself is two feet tall by one foot, uh, three inch hole. Has a side opening as you can see. And we've made these out of western cedar. We've also made them out of cypress. Um, these boxes will probably last longer than I will. There'll probably be some of them around when I'm not anymore. Three methods that we use to install them with the bottom one of those three, the preferred method. And you'll see I have photos of them in all three methods, on a snag or a tree and on a barn and on a post. Dan gets the box on his shoulder, goes up 10 or 15 feet. I stand on the ground with the camera. <laughs> See the box right here? He went up there on the ladder and put that up. This is a female kestrel, shot that up in Highland County coming out of the box. Here's Dan and Patty assembling a, a unit with a predator guard. You see this? This is shiny, slick metal that we put a piece of cut tuba for right here, right at the top there. And you have this tuba six and then tuba four where it's put together, you know, at 90 degrees. We nail that on there so that when the predator climbs up that pole, we, we hope won't be able to get past that. What are the predators? Raccoons are one. Snakes are the big ones. They'll go right around that and go up the pole and they'll, once they get in here, the snake will try to go up right in that opening right there. When he gets to the top, he can't get past it. And unless it's a really long snake, they can't wrap themselves around this and get past that. But raccoons, cats, critters like that will go up there. Black rat snakes. With my uh, bluebird boxes, I've got 14 of them that I monitor over on uh, pan tops. And I had a black rat snake literally as tall as I am in the box. Uh, got around my predator guards, got in there and ate five bluebird babies. And the knot in its middle was so big he couldn't get back out the hole of the box. <laughs> My box is open on the side. I opened it up, and here's these eyes looking at me. My wife said, oh, <laughs> she, keep, she keeps track of the eggs and when they hatch and all that kind of thing. Anyway, I uh, opened the side of the box and went on and monitored the other 13 boxes, hoping that the snake would make an exit. Well, I came back, and he hadn't. He was just curled up in there comfortable. You know, my belly's full. Leave me alone. So I got a stick and kind of booted him out of there. But... Uh, he, they, uh, they're very crafty getting, getting by predator guards. Now, a long one could get past these pred predator guards. Could they drop from like the top of the tree onto the box? Or? Do they drop from the, the question was, do they drop from the top of the tree? <clears throat> this particular one, there was um, blackberry vines that grew out near the box. And it came down the blackberry vine and then scratched 
stretched across to the top of the predator guard and then went into the box and ate the babies. Now, these boxes for the kestrels are not close to anything, so they can't do that. They have to go up, up, the, up the side. <clears throat> we haven't had too much problem with it. But uh, when we have a box like this, you can see the box is on the tree. There's nothing to stop the snake or the raccoon or the cat from going up there. The only thing that saves them is the depth of that box. The raccoon can't stick his arm down in there and get the baby and haul it out. So that kind of installation is one of our least preferred. If we go to the barn again, see the box right up there? <clears throat> Don't have too much trouble with predators there. <clears throat> this is our preferred method. We go to a farmer and say, can we put the boxes on your fence post? Generally, they're very good with that, no problem. And we just have very long wood screws and just screws this two by six right up against that, that uh, post of the fence. Now, the question is, would kestrels use wood duck boxes? Generally, where the wood duck boxes are is not kestrel habitat. They are more around the ponds, the rivers, and, and it's closed in. Kestrels like an open space. Now, <clears throat> certainly a kestrel could use a wood duck box, but generally not the same habitat. So, our mammalian, mammalian helpers. Horse comes up and stuck his nose in the back of the kestrel truck to see if there's anything in there to eat. And we go into areas like this where there's uh, horses around, cattle, and so forth. We see those cattle, we always ask this question. Some of them are aggressive. Uh, Dan is the major builder and installer, and he sees these water buffaloes, went out there, and those water buffaloes came after him. <laughs> So he just said, too close for comfort. We're not going to put a box out there. <laughs> Goat pastures, good sites. Uh, sheep pastures, where they have these llamas. Uh, up, up in the country, they have these llamas to keep out the coyotes. And uh, they do an amazing job. Now, um, we cannot monitor the number of boxes that we have out there, but we, this past year we did monitor the ones we have up in Highland County. Um, we used specialized equipment, and we did, it, we did some in Albemarle County, but mainly we monitored the ones that were in Highland County. And we used this stuff. This is a telescoping pole to go up 24 feet. This little device like right here is about the size of your cell phone. This is the camera. There's the lens of the camera right there. A little transmitter here. You put the camera on that pole. The lens is looking down. And you're there with a little, whoops, this piece in your hand and the camera transmits the image to the little piece in your hand. Now, you stick that camera in the box, like so. Sometimes you have to crawl over the fence to do it. Patty records the data. I'll show you what it looks like from that camera in just a couple of minutes. Give you some facts on what you look in there for. Clutch size, four to five eggs, just like bluebirds. Number of broods, one to, one to two per season. Length of the egg is much bigger than bluebird. And bluebirds lay their eggs one day at a time all week till they get four to six laid. And then the female will get on them and start to brood them or keep them warm. They will hatch all in the same day. Kestrels and other uh, birds like that don't do that. They lay their eggs one day at a time, but they start brooding, <coughs> excuse me, breeding them the minute they lay them. So they might hatch over a period of two or three or four days. 
And the ones that hatch first is the most likely to survive. And the one that la hatched last is least likely to survive. And if food gets short, that little guy is going to become lunch for some of the others. It's a tough world out there. Bluebirds incubate for about 12, 14 days. You can see from this, the incubation period and the nesting period, the kestrel makes a commitment of about two months when they lay that egg until that baby actually fledges. There's what the egg looks like when it's hatched. There's what it looks like in the box. There is the female bird in the box. This was not shot with that camera on the pole. But this one was. This is what it looks like. It's a JPEG image. And it comes into that little handheld unit. And then you can transfer the image from that little unit to your computer. <clears throat> Another incubating female. Now, when these babies are born, they are what's called altricial. There's two kinds of birds, altricial and precocial. The precocial kind are like chickens and geese and that kind of thing. They come out of the egg and they start eating right away and they're walking on their own and they're following the adults around. Those are precocial. These are altricial. They are out of the egg. They look like that. Can't see. They're helpless. They just kind of hang there. And they just kind of hang around. Come on and feed me. And you can see there you have two of them hatched and the eggs are still there. They're not hatched. And this is a couple days old, but yet we still have an egg that hasn't hatched. And then here we're, we're along a few more days and a few more days and a few more days. <laughs> Feed me. And it says, me, me. <laughs> And then after a couple of weeks, three weeks, they start to look like this. Now these babies, you think babies are kind of docile and they're just there waiting to be fed. I was with uh, some Kestrel researchers up near the town of Timberville. And, uh, you know, they said, oh, you know, here, hold one. Okay, so I held this little baby Kestrel. And I had him in this hand, and I went to move this hand by it. The leg comes out, the claws right into the hand. I thought, wow, this guy's for real. <laughs> anyway, unlike bluebirds, which leave a pretty clean nest, and I'll say clean almost, these guys, they kind of turn around, aim their butts up to the side of the box, and let it go. And you can see the side of the box there is kind of whitewashed. And here you can see it pretty clearly. <clears throat> now, monitoring these boxes is very different than monitoring my bluebird boxes. My bluebird boxes, if the female is there, she might stay there, she might leave. And monitor these boxes. That female comes out. This is what she looks like. She's diving on me. And she means business. This is, this is Lance Morrow. He's one of the researchers that I work with up in Timberville. And the design of his box is a little different than ours. But this is the female kestrel coming after him. Here she comes by and she shrieks as she comes by. And this next slide, this is her right here. She has come swooping in and knocked his hat off his head as <laughs> she's going by. And he's like, all right, Doug, this is enough. <laughs> he came down the ladder at that point. And here you can see one of the little ones. He's looking around and said, oh, the world looks different out here. And here comes mom with a big grasshopper. And here comes mom with, uh, I believe that's a field sparrow. The little bird. They'll take small birds. Here she comes with a big beetle to feed the babies. Here she comes with a praying mantis. Now here's dad with a mouse. Now you notice that mouse doesn't have a head. He thought, well, I got to have a little breakfast here too. <laughs> so he took the front part of the, of the mouse and he took the rest and gave it to the kids. 
kestrels will eat most anything they can catch. Um, little lizard, snake, not a very big snake, not that one that's as tall as I am by any stretch. But it's not that easy a job being a kestrel. This is a red-tailed hawk, and this is a kestrel. Everybody has to eat out there. Other critters will use these nest boxes. Starlings are the worst. They will evict um, a kestrel family. Sometimes, they don't always succeed. These critters here will evict a kestrel family. And they don't always succeed either. But they have to watch for those red-tailed hawks. These folks, yellow-shafted flicker, northern flicker, they'll use the boxes, as will the uh, tree swallow. And who do you think did that? Bluebird. Bluebird. They'll get in there too. Uh, they're not always successful because a kestrel will take a bluebird. And they will certainly take their babies. Now this guy here, he's pretty successful taking it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the boxes that we have on um, trees, these guys will get in there. Screech out. Now, this is the result of the monitoring in Highland County. We kept very careful records there. We didn't keep nearly so careful of records around this county. But you can see we have um, 43 nests we observed, 72 chicks counted that actually left. Occupancy rate, 74.42%. Now when this project started, we set a goal of 400 boxes around the state. That was two, two, this is the third year ago now. When we first started, we thought, is this too ambitious? Can we get this done? As of this winter, we've got 450. And we've got some in inventory that we haven't put up yet, but we don't put them up from now until like fall, because if we do, the starlings will get in there. So. We shot a picture of ourselves saying, this is box number 450, and that was right, uh, it's in uh, Albemarle County down below, uh, it's on Route 20, there's a vineyard down there. Guy let us put up, put up that box. VSO, VSO exists to encourage the study of birds. How many are familiar with VSO? How many VSO members here? None, okay. Uh, anyway, there's their website, and if you want to donate to that project, you certainly can do it. Photo credits. And there's Patty saying it's fun and good for the birds. So that is the show. Yes? How do you clean the boxes? I'm sorry? How do you clean the boxes? How do we clean the boxes is the question. Uh, with this 450 boxes, the answer is we don't clean them. Uh, we will wait probably another five years and then start cleaning them. And in that time, the kestrels will come and build a nest and then they build a very little nest. They just put a little bit of stuff on the bottom. But in five years, there probably won't be more than this much stuff on the bottom of the nest, of the bottom of the box. The walls of that nest will be white, and uh, pretty well covered, but uh, then we'll clean them out but you don't have to clean them every year like you do the uh, bluebird boxes. Yes? Return to the same box. Say again, do they return to the same box? Question is, do they return to the same box? Short answer is we don't know. We know that from the Kestrel researchers where the guy I showed you being attacked by the Kestrel, they have, they banned all of the babies and they have found babies coming back as adults to the box where they were hatched. So where the adults went, we don't know. But we do know they tend to stay, stay around that area. <clears throat> so 
Some kestrels migrate, some stay here all winter. Yes? Would you separate the kestrel boxes from the bluebird boxes? Is there a, a relationship that you try to avoid? <laughs> Everybody hear the question? Would we separate the kestrel boxes from the bluebird boxes? Um, when I got into this project with the kestrel boxes, I went, I thought, all right, where are we going to put all these boxes? And I thought, ah, I got a ready-made group of people to contact. It's the Bluebird Society, which is around the state. So I contacted them and said, we're looking for places to put kestrel boxes. And they said, no, not near the Bluebird boxes. <laughs> uh, we have put some close to them, but not many. Um, they will kill a bluebird now and then, but not too often. Uh, we'd like more open space for these kestrel boxes. A bluebird box you can put about every 100 yards. Kestrel box you want about every, oh, much farther than that, two or three times that distance. We've got one, by the way, off of uh, Route 53 over in Pleasant Grove. You know that uh, area right along, if, if you're at the school and you're going east, you'll come to the entryway to the park, and then there's a big open field there. We've got a kestrel box there, and we've got one back near their maintenance shed. If you go all the way back, there's one back there. And we've got one on uh, one of the big oak trees. If you go in on the entrance and take a left where the people with the horses go, there's a big oak tree there. We've got one there. So, yes, okay, yes. Are there any bird watchers groups here at Lake Monticello area? Are there any bird watching groups? Uh, probably the closest one is Monticello Bird Club. It meets in uh, Charlottesville. It meets on the first Wednesday of the month from September to May. Uh, this, this coming month of April will be the next to the last meeting where we have a speaker. And in the May meeting, we're going to have a photography contest, bird photography contest. But this coming, <coughs> excuse me, the first, the first Wednesday in April, we will meet there at 7 o'clock in the Ivy Creek Natural Area. Yes? Notwithstanding what you just said, uh, what seems to be the ideal population density for the kestrels, and what's the ideal spacing for the nesting boxes? What's the ideal spacing for nesting boxes is the question, and what's the population density, is that right? <clears throat> we try to put boxes about a half a mile apart. Uh, a big field where there might be, where we might see uh, several of them around, we probably would put them like four or 500 yards apart, but they don't, they don't like to be too close because they, they have, they have a, a lot of territory to hunt on. When they have five babies in there to feed, you've got to catch a lot of mice to feed them, and they don't want but so much competition from that. Yes? Are the wineries a good location for these? Are the wineries a good location? They can be, yes. They, can, they certainly can be. We have focused more on uh, putting them in fields where there's cattle and that kind of thing. Do they eat fruit? Say again? Do they, eat the fruit, the do they eat fruit is the question? No, they do not. Insects and, and mammals. And do they compete with cows for nesting territory or food? Do they compete with owls for nesting territory or food? They do, but <clears throat> owls, of course, hunt at night and they hunt during the day. But they, the owls don't eat so much the large insects as the kestrels do. But the owls, of course, eat the moles and voles and all those small mammals. And these uh, kestrels will take down, uh, particularly in spring, uh, a chipmunk baby. They won't go after an adult chipmunk so much. But we've seen them take uh, uh, the small chipmunk babies and kill them. Yes. How often do they use um, natural nests rather than box nests? I'm sorry? How often do they use natural nests compared to box nests? I'm sure they'll do it every chance they get if they can successfully compete with whoever else is trying to get in there. 
<clears throat> with bluebirds, I've seen bluebirds nesting in a natural cavity within sight of my bluebird box. I say, why are you doing that? You know, I have predator guards over here and marble countertops for the kitchen and all that sort of thing. <laughs> but birds have their own agenda. Are they the smallest hawks, the kestrels, or are there smaller ones? question is, are they the smallest hawks? They're actually a falcon, but they are the smallest falcon, yes. And there's no smaller hawk or that kind of bird than that. There's a, a saw-wet owl, which is about this high. It's just, it's just a little fatter than, so that's, that's a predator that's in that size range where it's very small. They migrate through Virginia. <clears throat> yes? What is the actual size? I mean, the pictures kind of show them they look very small. So are you talking inches or? <laughs> they are about the size of a blue jay. You're familiar with that, right? Blue jay, robin, right in that range. Females tend to be a little bigger than the males, but um, they're about that size. Pretty birds. Very difficult to approach. Most of them, uh, for some reason, they don't want to be around humans. I don't know what I've ever done to them, but they, they usually take off. Uh, I might have to put my blind up and sit there for three hours to have them come back, but, but they'll generally come back. Yes? impact on, on the number of kestrels? Right. Has the nesting project produced results? Are you seeing an increase in the number of kestrels now? Uh, it's hard to judge. Um, we are encouraged seeing the number that, that hatched in Highland County. Around here, I don't know because we haven't monitored the boxes, but uh, we asked the people in these different farms, do you see kestrels in that area? Do you see the activity? And we feel very encouraged with the reports that we're getting because people are saying, yes, they're coming, yes, they're there. So, yes, it is helping them. <clears throat> yes? What's the difference between uh, falcons and uh, hawks? Falcons can get birds in flight, is that? The question is, what's the difference between falcons and hawks? It's, it's a different family of bird is all. In the hawks, you have the beautios, which is the bigger soaring hawks. And you have a speci uh, two species of them here. You have the occipiters, which are the woodland hawks. These are smaller. That's the uh, Cooper's hawk and the sharp shinned hawk. They are smaller, and you find them more in the woods, and they more prey on birds where your larger hawks prey on more on mammals. And these falcons, uh, you have the peregrine falcon, the kestrel, you have the merlin, which are not too many merlins here. They tend to be more northern bird. And you have the northern goshawk, which is also a falcon, but it's more north of here. They tend, the larger ones of these uh, falcons will eat whatever they can catch. But these, 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 these this species here, these kestrels, it's more small mammals and large insects. If you get a merlin around and they come down here in wintertime, their main prey is birds too. They're bigger than a kestrel, significantly bigger. And they will eat a kestrel, but they will eat, again, mostly birds. But hawks, you have beautios, occipiters, and then falcons, which is a different, different uh, family of birds. They have more pointy wings, um, just a different family. But there's not a physical difference in the feathers or the makeup of the no. wings? Or no. It, well, the makeup of the wings, the shape of the wing, that kind of thing. But it's just a family like robins and cardinals. And okay. <clears throat> so I've seen it. Uh, yeah. Have been seen at Lake Monticello. Say again? I said I, I assume that kestrels have been seen near Lake Monticello. All right. I'm having a tough time hearing you. Can speak up. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that kestrels have been seen around Lake Monticello Has area. anybody oh, yeah. seen Oh, sure. Yeah. Kestrels are around here. I mean, they, if you drive around Route 53 and watch the wires out there, you'll see them. They'll park up there on the wires and they're scoping out what's out there. If they see something move, they go get it. Yeah. 
with this kind of an audience, we can get an email address from you, and when you have your next meeting, we can have it added to the blast out that goes out to the whole lake. Oh, okay. So you could get some of these people involved in that for you. Okay. We, okay. Uh, I have my card over here has my email address on it. Just email me there, or you can go online, www.monticellobirdclub, all one word, dot org, and you go to that website, and it'll tell you everything that's happening in the club. Yes? Most of the people here don't have acres and acres, acres where are like residential at Lake Monticello, but is there an education process even for people that live in, in, in residential areas about the impact of uh, pesticides? Is there an education program about the impact of pesticides? Is that right? If there is an organized one, I don't know it. But uh, from the people I know that are trying to do something about it, they find it a very tough project because there's lots of money involved there. Uh, farmers can, I don't know what the percentage of increase of their yield per acre is, but it's significant if they use these chemicals. And I know when I was a little kid, and many of you were a little kid, you saw, you drove by a cornfield, you saw corn stalks planted about this far apart. Well, now they're about this far apart. So you can imagine the amount of energy being drawn out of that land to support that, all those corn stalks and the corn itself. Very high intensity, intensive uh, monoculture farming. Um, that's what we do. We make money. And making money is a good thing, but I mean, I think we need to protect the planet more than we're doing right now, because what we're doing is not sustainable. But that's not my mission coming to tell you today. Um, I don't want to get into any politics <laughs> or any of that sort of thing. Okay, yes. Are there any opportunities here at Lake Monticello for uh, installing, uh, you know, Boxes and so on? The uh, question is, is there an opportunity at Lake Monticello for installing boxes? Is it, you know? The answer is, it is too wooded. Um, there's not enough room for the birds to hunt and, and find enough food. Um, over at uh, uh, the park, Pleasant Grove Park, I'm not sure how those boxes are doing there. I haven't been back to check them. I'm not sure, but you need open space. Um, farmland, that kind of thing is, is the best for them. What you can do is, um, if, if you donate to the VSO, Virginia Society of Ornithologists, that can help them pay the cost of these boxes. These boxes cost us about $50 a piece. They last a very long time. Yes, yes. What does the kestrel sound like? What does a kestrel sound like? Down, it's in the, uh, down in, the, in the stand. Where is it? There it is, right here. Uh, let me see here. Come on. Can you hear that? Is that a happy sound? <laughs> <laughs> um, was she angry or was she talking? He's just talking there. That one that was diving on the researcher there, he wasn't making this sound. <laughs> it was more like I'm here to kill you. <laughs> and you, you weren't, there wasn't any mistaking it. <laughs> okay, good question, yes? Would they do well underneath the power line areas that are kind of open fields? Question is, would they do well in a power line area? If it's open enough, it would, yes. But most power lines are only so wide. Well, we have some pretty wide ones around here. That's what I was wondering, if that okay. would be a good place to encourage them. We wouldn't, we wouldn't put any boxes in there because we don't think they're the preferred habitat. 
They like, they like plenty of open space. When you're feeding five babies and you gotta catch a mouse for every one of them about every four hours, <laughs> you're busy. It's like this year, did, did any of you see uh, the snowy owls? We had a snowy owl eruption this year. And uh, they came down from the Arctic Circle looking for food here. And uh, I got pictures of two of them, one in West Point and one up near um, town of Mount Crawford. They rely on lemmings up there. And when the lemming population takes a nosedive, they come south looking for whatever they can get. They eat ducks and uh, everything they can catch. And if you're in an area where your cat is running free and the snowy owl is in the area, you might want to keep that cat inside. Anyway, but these little guys, kestrels, your cats are all safe. <laughs> okay, any other questions? congratulate you for putting up 450 boxes with <laughs> yeah. just four other people. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, the Wildlife Committee is making a donation to VSO. VSO. Really do thank you. That. VSO will appreciate that. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Thank you.